grace. 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 All right, um, so tonight we're going to be going through the book of Esther, but before we do, I want to help clarify the timeline, and that's one of the reasons why things were thrown off. I thought we we're going to go through the book of Nehemiah tonight, um, and in fact, I told Stephanie we were going to, and then I had to text her today and say, no, not so much. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot of mentioning of Ezra and Nehemiah in both of their separate and their cooperative work in rebuilding the temple and, um, and Jerusalem. Yet, if you remember, I told you a few weeks ago that the story of Esther occurs in a 60-year gap between the events that are mentioned in Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. So you have the first six chapters of Ezra predate all three of them, okay? When you got Esther, you got Ezra, and you got Nehemiah, okay? The first six chapter of the book of Ezra it's just a historical account that Ezra is given that predates his own life, okay? Ezra doesn't even show up as being someone who is being actively used until the seventh chapter of Ezra, all right? But between chapter 6 and chapter 7, there's a gap of about 60 years, and that's when the entire life story of Esther takes place. Now, um, so you might wonder, why did we read Ezra first? Why not just start with Esther? Well, again, the reason is because the book of Ezra begins um, it, it, um, its first six chapters with events that predate not only Ezra by 80 years, but it also predates Esther by 20. So it made sense on a timeline to start with the book of Ezra because the events mentioned in the first six chapters predate all three of these people. Okay, And now, as I'm explaining part of this, I do have a graphic that should help you a little bit. And hopefully I can make it stay on the screen. I don't know if it's going to or not. But uh, you can see there, so it says King Cyrus. He's If you remember, all of this stuff is centered around Daniel. Uh, and, and I told you that before, but I'm going to back up just a little bit. In order to, uh, to attempt to follow a cohesive timeline, I decided to begin with Ezra. Um, and then circle back around to catch us up with Esther. So uh, now all of this is directly connected with the timeline from Messiah given to Daniel by Gabriel. Have you noticed that? Since we were in the book of Daniel, everything we've covered since Daniel has always pointed back to the revelations that were given to Daniel, right? And so we're still in that time frame right now. As you no doubt remember, because we've talked about it so much, the beginning of the countdown that was given to, De to Daniel by Gabriel that, that led to Messiah was at the issuing of the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, right? Everybody remembers that. You also no doubt remember that in total there were four decrees that were given for, uh, for the rebuilding of Jerusalem and so on, but the first three only focused on the temple, not on the city. Is that be with me? Remember that? Remember, but what Gabriel told Daniel was from the issuing of the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, the city, not the temple in Jerusalem. So the first three decrees had nothing to do with what Gabriel told Daniel. Okay? But those first, the first two decrees were covered in the first six chapters of Daniel. Then you have the life story of Esther. Then in chapter seven, of Ezra is when the third decree goes out, and that included Ezra himself, where he was told to go back to Jerusalem and help rebuild the temple. Then the fourth decree doesn't happen until the second book, uh, chapter of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah joins Esther, Ezra, I'm sorry, joins Ezra in Jeremiah, I'm sorry, in um, uh, Jerusalem, and begins its work of restoring the actual city and the wall of the city. All right? So we haven't gotten there yet. We're not yet at the decree that was foretold by Gabriel to Daniel, where you start the countdown to Messiah. Is that with me? Does that make sense? And you can see the, the timeline I given there up there. Ezra begins with the first of the decree of the of the decrees, starting in chapter one, which was given by Cyrus the Great, who was in power somewhere between 550 and 530 BC. The second decree was made by Darius in 517 BC, which is recorded in the sixth chapter of Ezra. Okay? Again, all of this predates Esther, Ezra, 
and Nehemiah, right? So that's why we went through the book of Ezra first, okay? Because the first six chapter deals with stuff that predates all of them, okay? As I told you, between chapter 6 and chapter 7 was the 60-year time span in which um, uh, uh, the uh, the lifespan, the entire lifespan and life story of Ezra takes uh, Esther takes place. Also, between this time of that 60-year time period is were the reigns of Darius and the, the reign of Xerxes. Xerxes. That is the father of Arta Xerxes. Okay? So you got Xerxes, and then his son is Arta Xerxes. Why we have, yeah, let's turn that off. So during that 60 year time frame that's between chapter six and chapter seven of Ezra, are you've got two kings that reign, Darius and then Xerxes. Xerxes is the one that Esther was married to. Okay? So that's the reason why it takes place between chapter six and chapter seven in that time frame. All right. So when we get to Ezra seven, seven. That was the third decree that was given 458 BC by Artaxerxes, who was the son of King Xerxes, the one that Ezra married. I keep on repeating it in a different way so that it kind of gets through your cranium. Are you getting this or no? Okay. The first king was King Cyrus. As to our purposes, the second king that was important in the lineup of this was Darius, because that's the decree of the second decree was given by Darius. Then came Xerxes. He had nothing to do with decrees whatsoever and the prophecy that was given to Daniel. It's just when Esther took place, all right? Then the son of Xerxes, who is Artaxerxes, he's the one that gives the command for Ezra to go back, which the third is the third decree. And then later, he's also the one that gives the fourth decree to Nehemiah to go back and actually, actually build the actual city and its wall. That's the one that Daniel was told about. Okay, so that's future. We'll get to that when we get to the second chapter of Nehemiah. Right now, we're looking at a story that took place between chapter 6 and chapter 7 in the book of Ezra, which predates Ezra. Okay, because remember, I'm going to say, I'm coming back around, I'll say it in a different way. King Xerxes was the guy that Esther was married to. The guy who was going to give the command to Ezra in Ezra chapter 7 to go back to Jerusalem was this guy's son. So the son wasn't even born yet. So the king that told Ezra to go to the city wasn't even around. When Esther is being the story, the life story of Ezra is going, Esther is going on. Okay. So that's why now we have circled back and we're looking at the life story of Esther. All right. And, and now as we will see in Nehemiah, we're going to see the fourth decree. But unlike Ezra and Nehemiah, the book of Esther does not focus on the restoration of Jerusalem or the temple at all but on a treacherous series of events that occur in Persia, which could have wiped out the entire Jewish race entirely. So there would have been no Ezra. There would have been no Nehemiah. There would have been no Messiah. Okay. So that makes Esther's book rather important. Would you agree with me? Okay. Now, while the sovereign work of God and his hand are clearly, clearly seen throughout the book of Esther, Curiously enough, God himself is never even specifically mentioned in the book. Esther's name means star. Now, there are those who, in an attempt to make more of her name than actually is there, they try to attribute to her name the meaning morning star. That is not true. Even David Guzik does this, and I don't know why, because he's usually spot on. I mean, he's, but no one's perfect, you know, and I'm sure that he could easily point to things that I've said that wasn't accurate either. But um, Morningstar is not the meaning of her name. It just means more. It just means star. Now, we're going to start now in Esther chapter one, and I'm just going to read the first verse and give you a little bit more, and then we're going to start reading through uh, um, uh, as much as we'll cover tonight. So in Esther chapter one, starting in verse one, says the following events happened in the days of Hazarius, I'm, I am referring to that Hazarius who was used, I'm sorry, who used to rule over the 127 provinces extending all the way from India to Ethiopia. Now, this is where I need to comment a little bit. This King Hazarius is well known in history, though more commonly he's known as Xerxes. Okay. The Bible, for whatever reason, in the Greek and Aramaic, used the word Hazarius. But there is no discrepancy because his name was called by several different names from different, um, different people um, throughout his province. But 
historically, predominantly, he was known in the Persian tongue as Xerxes. Okay, so every time, all the way through the Book of Esther, when you're hearing King Hazarius, it's actually talking about King Xerxes. Is somebody with me? Okay, now his father, Xerxes' father, was Darius who we read about during Daniel and throughout the book of Ezra. And we will also read about Darius in the book of Haggai when we get there. And this guy, Darius, passed on to Xerxes the entire vast Persian empire. The existence and circumstances of King Xerxes are very, very well documented and attested to. And no doubt this is part in part due to the sheer size and scope of this guy's empire. It was the largest empire the world had ever seen up to this point. Using a modern map, we would say that it covered all of Turkey, all of Iraq, all of Iran, all of Pakistan, all of Jordan, all of Lebanon, all of Israel, as well as parts of modern-day Egypt, Sudan, Libya, and Arabia. So this was a big empire. It was huge. Archaeology has proven, irre, uh, provided um, irrefutable evidence of the ruins of this guy's palace in Susa, which is, of course, a citadel, which, which was also mentioned in the book of Daniel. All right? Now, in fact, it was in one of his, if you remember, one of the, the visions that Daniel received, he, he says he was in the spirit and he saw the citadel in Susa. That's where this guy, King Xerxes, reigned from and ruled from. That's where Esther had her whole life story, was there in Susa. Okay? Now, the date was approximately 486 BC, which according to Guzik was a time when King Artaxerxes was planning, I mean, sorry, King Xerxes was planning for a doomed invasion of Greece, which would take place several years later after the story of Esther. At this time, at the, time the city of Athens in Greece was in its classical glory, and they were celebrating their seventh, 79th Olympic Games at that time period. Okay, That just gives you a historical context for when all these events were taking place with Esther. Now we're picking up in verse 2, but I want to explain, because immediately I've been talking about Xerxes, and you might wonder, well, where does Xerxes show up? He is this guy right here, King Hazarius. Okay, same guy. Verse 2, in those days, King Hazarius sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel. In the third year of his reign, he provided a banquet for all his officials and his servants. The army of Persia and Media were present, as well as the nobles and the officials and the provinces. Now, now that I just told you the scope of his empire, you know that this was a heck of a banquet. This had a lot of people at it, right? This was a big deal. He displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his majestic greatness for a lengthy time period, a hundred and eighty days to be exact. When those days were completed, the king then provided a seven-day banquet for all the people who were present in Susa, the citadel, for those of the highest standing to the most lowly. It was held in the court located in the garden of the royal palace. The furnishings included white linen and blue curtains hung by cords of the finest linen and purple wool on silver rings, alabaster columns, gold and silver couches displayed on a floor made of valuable stones of alabaster, mother of pearl, and mineral stone. So by today's standards, that would be a lavish place, right? Drinks were served in golden containers, all of which differed from one another. There wasn't a single gold cup that looked like another. Well, that took a lot of work of artisans, didn't it, right? Unique works to create enough goblets of gold for people to drink out of that had that many people. Because these were not just the high-ranking officials. They was from the high rank, highest ranking to the lowest ranking. All of them were there. That's a lot of gold cups, guys. I mean, you can literally retire on just the cups, right? So um, actually, several people could retire on just the cups. It says drinks were sold in golden containers all of which differed from one another. Royal wine was available in abundance at the king's expense. There was no restrictions on the drinking. Well, that big surprise. For the king had instructed all of his supervisors that they should do as everyone so desired. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in King Hazarus' royal palace. On the seventh day, as King Hazarus was feeling the effects of wine, he ordered... Mahuman, Biztha, um, Harbana, 
Bigtha, Abigtha, Zithar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who attended him, to bring Queen Vashi into the king's presence wearing her royal high turban. He wanted to show the people and the officials her beauty, for she was very attractive. Verse 12. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's bidding, conveying, uh, con conveyed through the eunuchs. Then the king became extremely angry, and his rage consumed him. The king then inquired of the wise men who were discerning of the discerners of the times, for it was the royal custom to confer with all those who were proficient in laws and in um, legalities. Those who were closest to him were uh, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Muraz, Mersina, and Memuka. I'm sorry, Memukin. These men were the seven officials of Persia and Media. Now, this is important that he gives this kind of detail because one of the things that we do have is a lot of information about this king. Okay, archaeology has proven a lot of these things. The, cit the citadel, the location, all of these things have been verified. All right. So, but if you don't have details, it's hard to verify much, right? So these details are important. It says, who saw the king on a regular basis and had the most prominent offices in the kingdom. The king asked, by law, what should be done to Queen Vashti in light of the fact that she has not obeyed the instructions of King Azarias conveyed through the eunuchs. Memukin the, then replied to the king and the officials, The wrong of Queen Vasti is not against the king alone, but against all the officials and all the people who are throughout all the province of King Hazarius. For the manner concerning the queen has spread to all the women, leading them to treat their husbands with contempt, saying, When King Hazarius gave orders to bring Queen Vasti into his presence, she would not come. And this very day the noble ladies of Persia and Media who have heard uh, the matter concerning the queen will respond in the same way to all the royal officials, and there will be more than enough contempt and anger. If the king is so inclined, then, let a royal edict go forth from him, and let it be written in the laws of the Persians and, the, and uh, Midia that cannot be repealed, that Vashti may not come into the king's presence, uh, uh, I'm sorry, into the presence of King Azarias, and let the king convey her royalty uh, to another who is more deserving than she is. And let the king's decision, which he will enact, be dis, um, disseminated throughout all his kingdom, vast as it is. I mean, again, just that alone is a huge deal. Because, again, no internet, no phones, and this decree is going to have to reach that huge area in every single province, right? So this was a big deal. It says, Then all the women will give honor to their husbands, from the most prominent to the most lowly. Verse 21, the matter seemed appropriate to the king and the officials, so the king acted on the advice of Memukin. He sent letters, th letters throughout all the royal provinces to each province according to his own script and in each people according to their own language. And that's the reason why right there, in his, in his province, there were many different languages, which is why his name wasn't always Xerxes. It might appear as a, a different transliteration of the same name throughout his kingdom, but they all knew who they were talking about, right? Says his own, their own language, that every man should be ruling his family and should be speaking the language of his own people. Esther chapter 2. There were, um, when these things had been accomplished and the rage of the king uh, Hazarius had diminished, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been um, decided against her. The king's servants who attended him said, Let a search be conducted on the king's behalf for an attractive young woman, and let the king appoint officers throughout all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the attractive young women to Susa the citadel uh, to the harem under the authority of Hegai. That's not Haggai, that's Haggai, the king's eunuch, who oversees the women and let him provide whatever cosmetics they desire. Let the young women uh, whom the king finds most attractive become, I'm sorry, let, let the young woman who the king finds most attractive become queen in place of Vashti. This seemed like a good idea to the king, so he acted accordingly. Verse 5. Now, there happened to be a Jewish man in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. He was the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been carried into exile with um, Jeconiah, king of Judah, 
whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken into exile. Now he was acting as the guardian of Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for neither his father, her father nor her mother was still alive. This young woman was very attractive and had a beautiful figure. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had raised her as if she had been her, his own daughter. Verse 8. It, was, it so happened that when the king's edict and his law became known, many young women were taken to Susa, the citadel, to be placed under the authority of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the royal palace to be under the authority of Haggai, who was overseeing the women. This young woman pleased him, and she found favor with him, meaning the eunuch, the overseer. He quickly provided her with, uh, with her cosmetics and her rations. He also provided her with the seven uh, special chosen young women who were from the palace. <clears throat> he then transferred her and her young women to the best quarters in the harem. Now Esther had not disclosed her people or her lineage, for Mordecai had instructed her not to do so. And day after day, Mordecai used to walk back and forth in front of the court in the, uh, of the harem in order to learn how Esther was doing and what might happen to her. So he was a good uncle, right? And at the end of the 12 months that were required for the women, when, uh, when the turn of each young woman arrived to go to King Hazarius, for, it was, this was, for in this way they had uh, fulfilled their time of cosmetic treatment, six months of oil and myrrh, and six months of, with perfume and various ointments used by the women, then the woman would go to the king in the following way. Whatever she asked for would be provided for her to take with her from the harem to the royal palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to a separate part of the harem to the authority of uh, Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was overseeing the concubines. She would not go back to the king unless the king was pleased with her and was and she was requested by name. When it became the turn when it became the turn of Esther, daughter of Abhel, the um, the uncle of, the uncle of Mordecai, who had raised her as if she was her own his own daughter, to go to the king, she did not request anything except what Hegai, that's the king's eunuch, um, who was overseer of the women, had recommended. So she had favor from the moment she hit the door, right? I mean, not only did um, this this overseer of all the women, um, did, did she find favor in his eyes, but he assigned seven women to attend to her and then placed her in the very best quarters that were available. And she was kind of like his her point man who helped her um, throughout this whole process. And he actually gave her advice as to what to take into the presence of the king. And she said, well, you know, if that's what you said. That's what I'll do, right? So uh, yet Esther met with the approval of all who saw her. Verse 16. Then Esther was taken to King Hasarius at his royal residence in the 10th month, that is the, tenth, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she met with his loving approval more than all the other young women. So he placed the royal high turban on her head and appointed her queen in place of Vashti. So he didn't even go to the rest, see the rest of the women that had been brought to him throughout all the other provinces. As soon as he found Esther, he knew she was it. Now she's going to be the replacement uh, for Queen Vashti. Now, then the king prepared a large banquet for all of his officials and his servants. It was actually Esther's banquet. He also set aside a holiday for the provinces, and he provided for offerings at the king's expense. Now, when the young women were, uh, were being gathered again, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther was still not divulging her lineage or her people, just as Mordecai had instructed her. Now, we don't know why Mordecai had told her not to divulge this, because everybody in the province was underneath the king. I mean, it's not like... I mean, there were native-born Persians and native-born um, Medes, but almost everybody under the empire were, in one way or another, captives. So it couldn't be because, well, you're a captive, so don't let him know that you're one of the captives, because pretty much I would guarantee 85% or more of the women who had been brought to the king were all part of, you know, part of different captivities that had been brought underneath his authority. So it probably wasn't that. More than likely... Mordecai was probably being, number one, led by the Holy Spirit to tell her that. But number two, he probably knew, given the history of the Jewish people, that if there's anybody who's going to get persecution, it's going to be the Jews. So don't tell them where you came from. 
just keep that silent, you know, just keep the status quo. And, and he wasn't telling her to lie. He just said, don't bring it up, right? Don't offer the information. So in the now verse 21 says, in those days, while Mordecai was st sitting at the gate, the king's gate, Big Than and Turesh, two of the king's eunuchs who protected the entrance, became angry and plotted to assassinate King Hazarius. When Mordecai learned of the conspiracy, he informed Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in Mordecai's name. The king then had the matter investigated, and finding it to be so, had the two conspirators hanged on the gallows, and it, and, um, it was then recorded in the Daily Chronicles in the king's presence. Now that's important because later on this is going to be um, something that the king totally forgets about this entire event. And years later... When he couldn't sleep, we're going to read about it. His, uh, um, he's going to have some people come and read the historical documents to him. And when they they read it, and this whole game, this guy Mordecai's name comes up, he, um, uh, it becomes an integral part of saving the Jews. Okay, so it's important that this detail was placed in here that this was recorded in the king's, um, uh, uh, in the daily chronicles in the king's presence. Now, in Esther chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Some time later, King Hazarius promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, exalting him and setting his position above all of the officials who were with him. As a result, all the king's servants who were at the king's gate were bowing and paying homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded. However, Mordecai did not bow, nor did he pay him homage. So this guy has been placed in a position of high authority in all of the kingdom. And the command had been given that whenever this guy walks by, you make sure that you pay homage to him and bow down, which is a form of worship. And Mordecai refused to do it, right? And Haman, of course, Haman being a, a puffed up man and proud and, and, and arrogant and filled with himself because all the king had done for him, it made him angry that Mordecai was the one person that, when he walked by, didn't bow, okay? So that was the burr in his bonnet right there. So it says, Then the servants of the king, who were the king's president, asked Mordecai, Why are you violating the king's commandment? And after they had spoken to him day after day, without his paying any attention to them, they informed Haman uh, to see whether his attitude on Mordecai's part would be permitted. Furthermore, he had disclosed to them that he was a Jew, when Haman saw that Mordecai was not bowing or paying homage to him, he was filled with rage. But the thought of striking out against Mordecai alone was repugnant to him, for he had been informed of the identity of Mordecai's people. So Haman sought to destroy all Jews, that is, the people of Mordecai, who were in all the kingdom of Hazarius. So in other words, what happened was, was when Haman realized that this was a Jew, and he realized the history of the Jews, because remember, before the cap the um the conquering of Nebuchadnezzar, the Jews conquered everybody. And even people who did conquer them and carry them away captive eventually would destroy themselves and the Jews went back free. The Jews always wound up on top. And so Haman thought, you know what? I don't want to come against Mordecai publicly on my own authority. I'd rather come against the whole lot of them in the king's authority. Are you following? Okay? So that's what's taking place here. So in the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of the king Hazarius' reign, Pur, that is, the lot, was cast before Haman in order to determine a day and a month. So they were essentially, this was like the Jews did. They would cast lots. They would uh, roll dice. By today's standards, you would call it rolling dice, okay? To determine um, a day and a month. It turned out to be the twelfth month, that is, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to king Hazarius, there is a, 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 a I'm sorry, particular people that is dispersed and spread among the inhabitants throughout all the provinces of your kingdom, whose laws differ from those of all the other people. Furthermore, they do not observe the king's laws. It is not appropriate for the king to provide a haven for them. If the king is so inclined, let an edict be issued to destroy them. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to be conveyed to the king's treasuries for the officials who carry out this business. Verse 10. So the king removed his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadath, Hamadath the Agite, who was hostile towards the Jews. The king replied to Haman, Keep your money and do with those people whatever you wish. So, now, of course, 
King Azarius didn't realize his wife was a Jew because it had been hidden from him. She didn't, he didn't, he didn't ask her and she didn't divulge it. So he's issuing an edict that would kill his own wife, right? And he doesn't even know it. It says, everything Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and governors who were in every province and the officials of every people, province by province, according to its script, and the people by people, according to its language. In the name of Azarius, uh, King Azarius, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by the, the runners to all the king's provinces, stating that they should destroy, kill, and annihilate all Jews, from the youth to the elderly, both women and children, on a particular day, namely the 13th day of the 12th month, that is the month of Adar. That's the, that's the day that came up when they rolled the dice or when to do this. Is everybody with me? Okay. And to loot and to plunder their possessions. A copy of these, this edict was to be presented as law throughout every province. It was to be made known to all the inhabitants so that they would prepare for this day. The messengers scurried forth with the king's order. The edict was issued in Susa, the citadel, while the king and Haman sat down to drink. The city of Susa was in an uproar. Chapter 4 now, when Mordecai became aware of all that has been done, he tore his garments and put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out into the city, crying out in the loud and bitter voice. But he went no further than the king's gate, for no one was permitted to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Throughout each... Now, that's important there as well. Okay? It's not important for now, but it's important for when we get to the book of Nehemiah. In the king's presence, you couldn't come into the king's presence with sadness or with mourning. You weren't allowed to come into the king's presence like that. Okay? Which reminds me of another king. God, right? Enter into his presence with singing, right? And with rejoicing, right? Now, does that mean as you and I, we can't come into his presence sad? No, but he would prefer that he came in happy, right? Okay, because God is a God of joy, right? But uh, this king here didn't want that to happen. That becomes very, very important because later on when we get to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, he heard how Jerusalem was doing, how the city itself still laid in ruins and its walls were still burned. And because he didn't know that, he was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, this guy's son, right? And one day he came in, as uh, you know, after he heard that news, he came um, came in bearing wine before the king, and he couldn't disguise the fact that his face was sad. You don't do that, right? And so we're gonna we're gonna see how that actually gets the attention of King Artaxerxes, and it works to God's uh, um, uh, um, the, the favor of the Jews because God set it up that way. Okay, but so I wanted I just want to make note of this as we went through it, so you knew when we got to Nehemiah, this is something you don't do. And so, and, and that's why when you reread it in the book of Nehemiah, when the king called him out and he said, you know, wh why do you have a long face? Surely this is nothing but sadness of heart. It says Nehemiah was filled with fear. Well, that's why, because you don't come into the presence of the king sad, right? In other words, he could have, been, he could have lost his life that day for that, right? So, uh, so you can see now why Nehemiah was, when we get to Nehemiah, you'll understand why he was filled with fear, all right? So anyway, it says, um, Verse 2, it says, But he went no further than the king's gate, for no one was permitted to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Throughout each and every province where the king's edict and law were announced, there was considerable mourning among the Jews, along with fasting, weeping, and sorrow. Sackcloth and ashes were characteristic of many. When Esther's female attendants and her eunuchs came and informed her about Mordecai's behavior, the queen was overcome with, with anguish. Although she sent garments for Mordecai to put on so that he could remove his sackcloth, he would not accept them. So Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been placed at her service, and instructed him to find out the cause and the reason for Mordecai's behavior. So Hathak went to Mordecai at the plaza of the city in front of the king's gate. Then Mordecai related to him everything that had happened to him, even the specific amount of money that Haman had offered to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to be destroyed. He also gave him a written copy of the law that had been disseminated in Susa for the destruction so that he could show it to Esther and talk to her about it. He also gave instructions that she should go before the king to implore him 
and petition him on behalf of her people. So, Hathak returned and related Mordecai's instruction to Esther. Then Esther replied to Hathak with instructions for Mordecai. All the servants of the king and the people of the king's provinces know that there is no one uh, that there is no one law applicable to any man or woman who comes uninvited into the king's inner court. Uh, inner, inner court. That person will be put to death unless the king extends to him the gold scepter, permitting them to be spared. So, if you came before the king without being invited by the king, it was a death sentence unless he decided to let you live, and he indicated that by pointing the, his scepter at you. So you didn't just come in and talk to the king, ever. Nobody did. Not even his wife. All right? And so Mordecai was saying, I want you to go up here before the king and ask him to reverse this decision. And she's like, if I go there, I'm going to die unless by the flip of the coin he decides he's in a good mood and points his scepter at me. So you see what she's saying, right? Now, he says, and now I have not been invited to come into the king's presence for some 30 days. So she's already kind of feeling she may not be in the favor of the king. Because he hasn't even called on her in 30 days, and for her to just appear out of nowhere might be a death sentence. So she was concerned for her own life. Now, she should have been concerned for the, the life of the Jews, but at the moment she was concerned for her own life. Mordecai essentially reproves her, as you'll see in a moment, and she had the kind of heart to change her mind, okay, because she was a good woman. All right, now verse 12 says, When Esther's reply was conveyed to Mordecai, he, sa he said to take back this answer to Esther. Don't imagine that because you were part of the king's household, you will be the one Jew who will escape. If you keep quiet at this time, liberation and protection for the Jews will appear from another source. Listen to that. That's why we sang the songs we sang tonight. Mordecai knew God would deliver them. God will use you if you'll let him. But if you choose to not be used by God, then deliverance will come through another person. But it is coming. Listen to the faith of Mordecai, right? If you keep quiet at this time, liberation and protection for the Jews will appear from another source while you and your father's household will perish. It may very well be that you have achieved royal status for such a time as this. And thus that phrase was born. How many times in Christendom have you heard such a time as this, right? It says, then Esther sent this reply back to Mordecai. Go assemble all the Jews who were found in Susa and fast on my behalf. Don't eat and don't drink for three days, night or day. My female attendants will also go and, uh, and fast in the same way. Afterwards, I will go to the king, even though it violates the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai set out to do everything that Esther had requested of him. Chapter 5. It so happened that on the third day, Esther put on her royal attire and stood in the inner court of the palace opposite the king's quarters. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the palace opposite the entrance. When the king saw Queen Esther standing at the court, she met with his approval. The king extended to Esther the gold scepter that was in his hand, and Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. The king said to her, what is on your mind, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even as much as half of the kingdom will be given to you. Esther replied, If the king is so inclined, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. The king replied, Find Haman quickly, so that he may do as Esther has requested. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. While at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your request? It shall be given to you. What is your petition? Ask for as much as half of the kingdom, and it will be done. Esther responded, My request and my petition is this. If I found favor in the king's sight, and if the king is inclined to grant my request and perform my petition, let the king and Haman come again tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare for them. At that time, I will do as you, the king, wishes. Now Haman went forth that day, pleased and very much encouraged. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, and he did not rise nor tremble in his presence, Haman was filled with rage towards Mordecai. But Haman restrained himself and went on to his own home. He then sent for his friend to join him, along with his wife, Zeresh. 
Haman then recounted to them his fabulous wealth, his many sons, and how the king had magnified him and exalted him over the king's other officials and servants. Haman said, furthermore, Queen Esther invited me not invited only me to accompany the king to the banquet she has prepared, and also tomorrow I invited along with the king. Yet all of this fails to satisfy me so long as I have to see that Mordecai, the Jew, sitting in the king's gate. Haman's wife, um, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows 75 feet high built, and in the morning tell the king that Mordecai should be hanged on it, and then go with the king to the banquet well contented. <clears throat> it seemed like a good idea to Haman, so he had the gallows built. And that is where we're going to end tonight. In a cliffhanger. <laughs> so, uh, but I want you to see how all of this is conspiring together. And and I want you to see the faith of Mordecai. Don't lose sight of that because God honors this man greatly in the end, right? But he had great faith. He knew that if, if Esther doesn't let herself be used, then, then deliverance is going to come somewhere else. You know, but and, and, and his wording, he didn't know for certain, but he said, but you, you don't know, Esther, that but maybe you were raised to this position for such a time as this. Right. So don't don't lose. Don't miss your day of visitation. Right. Don't miss your opportunity. And and and, and notice that Esther had the, a good kind of heart. Her first thought was about herself. Well, how many times did that happen with you and me? Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, when bad things happen, sometimes our first thought is how this is going to affect me. But was that her end decision? No, she was a good woman. She was a godly woman, right? And she said, you know what? I'm going to do what you ask. I'm just asking that you you pray for me fast, that I'll have success when I go before the king and I won't be killed, right? But whether I die or I don't die, I'm still going to go. Well, she was a good woman, wasn't she? Thank God for Esther. She, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of patriarchs that we can look back to. But we have a, a good handful of women who were powerfully and mightily used by God, and these were women of outstanding character. Amen? And they should be honored as much as anybody else who bore the name of God. Amen? So Esther was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And we're going to find out more about her next week. But I want you to see how, again, I hope this this helped you here, this outline that I gave you, because it gives you an idea how all this comes together towards the point where the countdown's going to come towards Messiah because after this, after Nehemiah and the time period of rebuilding the the um, the the city of Jerusalem and its wall, from that day forward, uh, because there was a, another event that takes place, and I'll talk to you about that in another date. After that time, God laughs us into <laughs> silence, and you don't hear a word from God speaking to Israel until Messiah comes. And so these events are the most pivotal ones in Jewish history until Messiah came. So and all so all of these prophetic books that we're reading are all spearheading these events, and they're all coming together at once, right? And so that's the reason why it's kind of hard to outline it to you as we're going through the Bible, because there's some books we've left hanging in order to try to create a timeline, some type of a some type of cohesive timeline, and we have to circle back and get other books because I don't want to lose the the events as they're transpiring one after the other. You know what I'm saying? So um, hopefully that helps you somewhat. Now, um, based on what we've learned so far, does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Yes. Okay. So you always read from you've been reading from the Net Translation lately. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the Net Translation didn't have the the um, audio for it on uh -huh. my Bible. Yeah. So we listened to a different version. Okay. So in some of the versions, and I was discussing this with Terry, mm -hmm. um, it's trivial, but in some of the versions, it uses the word like violet or purple about mm -hmm. the the first part of that line. Yeah. Uh -huh. six. Some of them use white, blue, and green. Mm -hmm. What I mean, in, in my well, opinion, and if you go, yeah. I looked at, I was, that's what I was doing when you came in the room earlier. Yeah. And that don't make sense to me because mm -hmm. purple does not have to do with anything with blue and green. Yeah. Well, well are you talking about the, the curtains that were in the... the, the yeah, the... because it, oh, okay. it goes on to say about the cords being white and purple. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay. Most of them agree with that part of the verse. But yeah. The rest of them... They're... I'll have to look it up. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, because like in... Um, for instance, the one we were listening to was the Holman translation. Mm -hmm. It says... Violet, 
mm-hmm. and then some of them say purple, and then some of them say white, blue, green, some of them say white, blue. Mm-hmm. Then that's the, and my point is not mm-hmm. about the colors because, like Perry said, if I'm really seeking, I, I I will figure that out. Yeah. But if someone is new to the Bible and new to yeah, the the Bible is like any other book. There's going to be things because of the translations that they are written into. There's going to be misunderstandings. Um, uh, some of the misunderstandings, like when you're dealing with uh, uh, the King James version, the King James version was re- was off of the Masoretic text, which is an inferior text, very inferior in comparison to most other texts that we have that date back further. So the 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 further back in history you go, the closer to the events they're talking about you get, mm-hmm. right? And the closer you get to those events, the more accurate the information is going to be. Okay, so when the King James was around, they used the Masoretic text, uh, 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 and the Mas- Masoretic text was really just not a very good. I mean, it wasn't terrible. I mean. To be honest about it, I mean, we really don't have any truly bad copies of Scripture. They're just, in, especially when you, and you have to understand, I mean, it's a good question, and that's what I want to spend a little bit of time with it. You need to understand, the Bible is so ridiculously unique in all literature from the beginning of the world until now. There's nothing like it. There's absolutely nothing that's even close to it. The, the, we have got so many copies of this uh, of of the Old Testament and the the letters in the New Testament that it's literally like I've so I've used this word before. Uh, it's a I'm borrowing from a word from um, Daniel Wallace. We have an embarrassment of riches. If you were to take most major historical um, books that there are of antiquity, where we get knowledge about say. Uh, um, uh, uh, various kings like the uh, Alexander the Great comes to mind, especially, um, or even any of the Roman empires or I mean emperors or any of these kings and stuff like that that you read about from antiquity. If you look at the documentation in history that we have of them, the stack is probably about maybe that tall, maybe an inch of all the collective works from every around the world. That's all the information we have on them. All right. The rest of it, we dig up through archaeology and try to piece together ideas that we're not absolutely sure it turned out this way, but we think it did based on what we're uncovering, but we don't actually have any text that tells us. So we've got this little bit of text, and the rest of it we kind of make up based on what we were able to dig up, okay? That's all they've got. The Bible, literally, if you were to stack the documents, almost go over a mile high. That's what I mean by an embarrassment of riches. We And between those documents, about the biggest problem you're going to find is a mistranslation of a color. Or maybe instead of saying Xerxes, it'll say Hazarius. But it, there's no question who this guy is because of the time period, the location, and all the facts surrounding what's in the book of Esther. You know who it was. Right, and like I said, in that huge province of that huge area over there, his kingdom spanned through. He was called by many names, by many languages. Right, I mean, Jesus is called Jesus in English, but he's called Jesus in a, in other language and Jesus in other languages. But it's still Jesus, right? Uh, which one's right? They're, they're all right. <laughs> There's no wrong. They're all talking about the same guy. The guy's the thing that's important, not how you pronounce his name. Well, in some of these documents. All it takes literally is just changing, either leaving one letter out or a little, one little, um, what you might call what appears like an apostrophe or something like that in that language to turn a color purple to the color green. That's all it would take. And so you've got some text that will show something, one thing, and one will show another, but all of them agree on the location, that there were so many curtains, that they were hanging by silver um, cords, that the that um, that there were golden cups and they were all unique. All the facts that still you walk away with what happened is still there. You just might walk away with a misunderstanding about a single color, maybe. You said, can you see what I'm saying? That, now, am I saying that that's not important for some people who come to the Bible and think, well, it's completely free of errors? Well, it's free of errors based on what translation you're reading. 
you're going to run into one that might use the word green and another one uses purple. Which one's right? Because if one's right, the other one's clearly wrong, right? Okay. But that's, and I taught this way, way back. And if this would really help you guys, if you went back and read, I, I wrote an article on this. It's called Copy of Copies. Um, uh, yeah, Copies of Copies. Um, I don't know. I forget the rest of the title. But it's the only, if you did the, if you did a search on a website and you found just typed in copy of copy, it's the only thing that's going to come up with that title. And it gives you a, a, an understanding of the way that things were translated, a, an understanding of what we have to work with in the manuscripts, and how um, the the basis for our understanding, getting a picture of what happened in all of these events, are outlandishly accurate outlandishly accurate, down to details of cops and hanging curtains, right? Uh, every once in a while, you're going to run into an issue like you brought up, and it's a good one. I'm not minimizing what, what Stephanie brought up because it's important because you all need to know that one of the problems that we've had in Christendom, and unfortunately, this is, this is the one, one of the few things where the church influenced the world, okay? Usually, it's the other way around. The world's influencing us. But one of the few ways that we've influenced the world is by setting the Bible on such a ridiculous pedestal where one word can't be wrong or the whole thing's wrong. The Bible never claimed that. It was written by human beings inspired by the Spirit of God. That's why you can read the exact same account of the life of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's coming from different angles. Now, where he was is all going to be accurate. What he said is going to be accurate, but they're going to use different words to represent what Jesus said. Because nowhere in there does it say, this is a direct quote, word for word, of what Jesus said on this date, this time, this many seconds into the day. No one says that. That, that level of expectation of Scripture is, is inappropriate because it's a relational book, right? I, I learn what it says because someone conveyed to me that knowledge. Does that mean that the words they're saying is exactly word for word what Jesus said? In fact, the exact same enunciation. No, but these are the things he said. Are you following me? And to put it on this level up here is an unreasonable standard that the Bible never claims to be true. Are you following me? Right. The Bible is, uh, in, in, in this article, I address, address three different things. Inerrancy, um, what are the three of them? Inspiration, inerrancy, and I think it's accuracy, but it could be, I don't know remember which one it is. But the word inerrancy, there is no universally accepted definition for the word inerrancy. It can mean what the text conveys is ac accurately represents what happened, or it could mean that every comma is in the right place, the grammar is exactly the way it was stated, and it's word for word. Well, that latter one is not a good definition for inerrancy for the Bible. And it was never intended to be. Are you following me? Okay. So those kind of expectations we have tried to convey to the world. Well, the word, the Bible is absolutely perfect. Well, define perfect. Are you, are you seeing what I'm saying? By perfect, do you mean there's never a sense in which metaphor is used? Well, no, I'm sorry that the Bible's not perfect because metaphors are used, right? Uh, are, are there are there times when th where 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 due to the limitations of language, words are used that uh, like a, a great example is stars. You'll you'll see the word star used in the Bible, but stars refer to any luminary that was in the night sky. Any luminary, it could be a planet, it could be a solar system, it could be a galaxy, it could be an actual star. It could be a planet. Anything that gave off light in the night sky was this word that in English we translated with the word star. But the actual word in the Greek is just luminary. Well, by that standard, it's right. When it says luminaries. You know, on the, that guy, Degasi, I brought up the other day, uh, they, um, he, he discredits the entire Bible because in the book of Revelation it says stars are going to fall from the sky and you know stars can't fall from the sky because they're, they're super huge, you know, things that are bigger than the earth. They couldn't fall onto the earth. It would consume the earth. 
Well, he's he's talking in, in something he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because the Bible, uh, number one, the book, the word star throughout the book of Revelation is used more metaphorically than it's ever used literally. Okay, we know that for a fact. The very first chapter, it says, in Jesus' hands are seven stars, and those stars are the angels of the seven churches. The very first chapter, you use the word star metaphorically, and it defines what the stars are. You see what I'm saying? There's other times where a star is really referring to a comet or an asteroid because the original word was luminary. It wasn't star by a scientific meaning of the English word star. We're talking 2,000 years ago in another language. The word was luminary. Can you have comets fall to the earth? They happen all the time. Can you have meteoroids fall to the earth? They happen all the time. So could you have large ones fall to the earth and it fit what Revelation says? Yes, absolutely. Because the word star there doesn't mean the English word star. It means luminary, something that makes light in the night sky. Is everybody with me? So it's, But see, when we hold the Bible to a ridiculous standard, then we wind up having problems. So you and I having that knowledge, we can help people who come to you and say, well, you can't rely upon the Bible. And they might quote from Degasi because he's a brilliant man and he knows it. He talks about how the star is going to fall from heaven. And isn't that funny? Ha ha ha. Because we know that can't happen. And you're like, well, wait a minute. L let me explain something to you that obviously Degasi doesn't know and you don't know. And explain it. Don't do it cocky. But just say, you, you need to understand, this was written 2,000 years ago. There was no standard definition for the word star. In fact, the word star didn't even exist 2,000 years ago. It was just the word luminary. It just means something that makes light in the night sky. So it could be referring to anything, a meteor, an asteroid, anything. You, are you following what I'm saying? So this is what's, uh, this kind of knowledge helps us not have an unrealistic expectation of Scripture, but... And it allows us to stand back and wonder at what we do have. Because like I said, what we have is an embarrassment of riches. I mean, uh, between, just in, I think, just in the New Testament, you could claim, and I've told you this before, it's in that article I told you, you can look up on the church website, depending on, again, depending on your definition of a variation or a variant, you can say that the New Testament has anywhere from 200,000 to 400,000 variations. Where there's a where there's a problem in the text, <clears throat> anywhere from two hundred thousand to four hundred thousand problems in the text. All right, what do these pro define a problem for me? Over ninety percent of them have to do with the spelling of a word where the word is clearly understood, regardless of the spelling. You know who it's talking about, or the replacement of a pr primary noun with a pronoun where who they're talking about is still very obvious in the text. That's 90% of them right there. It conveys no um, a problem to the text. Anyone reading it would have known what it's talking about. So 90% of the problem is already gone right there. But those are included in variants. And if you go to YouTube and you want to find out, you know, like, a, um, uh, um, I forget his, his name now. I could have told you if I wasn't trying to. Um, Bert Erdman. He used to be a Christian and he used to be a scholar. And, uh, but... He also has other issues in his life, which made him want not to agree with the text. And so now he's a strong advocate against the Bible. And he goes telling everybody. I mean, he tours the world telling them there's so many variations of the scripture. There's so many variants. There's over 400,000 variants in scripture. You can't rely upon that Bible. And he doesn't tell them that he knows darn well that over 90% of them don't convey any problem with the text whatsoever. He's not going to tell them that because it steals his thunder. Are you following me? And, and I go through that article, and that article explains what all the variations are. And when you get down to the very bottom, there's only two in the entire New Testament that, that can convey a problem with the text. But when you take a step back and you look at everything the New Testament says, does it change any doctrine in the New Testament? No, it doesn't. So the job of the New Testament, which was to convey the doctrine of truth, is completely untouched by those. It doesn't matter. Yes. You know what keeps going through my mind is is God was kind of playing a game of whatever towards the arrogance. Of exactly, you're right. Because God wants, God wanted, and oh, has always wanted to be sought and found. 
And so he doesn't put himself out there where you can't deny him in, entirely, right? He puts enough out there to bait you. But he also allows for these things in the text because of the fact that, number one, he wants to use humans, and humans are flawed, right? But will but can he trust them by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to still convey the heart of the matter? Yes, absolutely, right? And so, and that's what God was aiming at. But the problem is what, what God was aiming at in the scriptures and what we're aiming at in scripture are two different aims. And we need to align ourselves with God, I suggest. Amen? But but one thing I can say absolutely is that, it, that the worst thing you're going to run into in the Bible is going to be a time where something like this, where there's a green curtain instead of a purple one. But the one thing we know is there were curtains there. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, it doesn't really convey any real problem with the text, but is but again, is that an issue that's worth addressing? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you, if you read the rest of that verse, mm -hmm. they all agree that it was purple cords and the silver and the gold stuff. Mm -hmm. So they all agree on that, like you say. Yeah. Obviously there was some hangings and regardless yeah. of what color they were. Yeah. But you also said it's depending on how the person who was translating it from that language to English. Mm -hmm. Or to the language before right, it was translated but, English, yeah. But yeah, that could make a big difference. Too. Oh yeah. But I just we listened to we, we mm -hmm. sorry we fell asleep to it, but we listened to it the first mm -hmm. time, um, in the Holman translation. Yeah. And then on our way here, we start we we started to do that, and then Stephen said, "No, that was driving him crazy." So we listened mm -hmm. to it in the King James version, mm -hmm. and then I dawned, it dawned on me. There's a difference, difference between the two. That well, and that's a good point. I'm glad you bring that up because, again, there, that's the Masoretic text that the King James is using. The right. Holman is using a much more modern text. But, well, I mean, it's text. not just those two yeah. versions. No, I know. I mean, I know. Um, the net version uses the word purple in both mm -hmm. times. Yes, absolutely. But mm -hmm. the, it's just, I don't know. No, and I, I will look into it because it's important. Kind of like the thing that you brought up the time before. Um, and I and then I remember I contacted you about it, that. It, but, but it um, wasn't about what the Bible said. Mm -hmm. It's about what Mark said. What do you mean? You, it, I was explaining this to Terry. Uh -huh. um, you, I'm, I don't remember the exact number, but say uh -huh. the number was 538 in the Bible. You said 539 or 537. Okay. okay. So it was just, it's probably, just the way I said it. It's just probably, yeah. Okay, so an error on my part. You yeah. really fast sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes I think your brain is working like five <laughs> miles ahead of time. <laughs> Yeah, that but does I, happen. But that's all it was. With that so it wasn't the text, it was what I said. Right. Okay, but, got it. But in this one, it is the text. I mean, it, yeah. I mean it's clearly, but a it difference, could be yeah. just the way it was translated. Yeah. So. So I, but I will look into it because it's important. But I'm hoping that you guys understand how it isn't terribly important, but it's still, it's worth looking at. There's no question. Especially because the more educated you are, you're going to have less things that people can throw at you and you just have a dumb look on your face. You're like, I don't know. You know what I mean? At least you'll be able to answer it. So I, I, I do want to look that up. I was just proud that I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm proud that you're paying enough attention to even notice. But so that's like, important. Wait a second. I have a question. Yeah. No, it's very, I very said, good. I told Steven, I said, don't steal my thunder either. Yeah. And, 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 and again, in, in the text that we were talking about earlier that was from, um, I think, I don't know if it was Lamentations or Ezekiel. Um, I'm sorry, Lamentations or Ezra. I can't remember. But um, in the the list it gave, of it the of, as it was in Ezra, um, at the very end was another discrepancy, and that was one of the translations talks about gold, how many gold coins there were, and the other one gave it gold by weight, not by the name of the coin. And so if you if you take the coins, say each coin weighs a couple of ounces, right? That, well, then the number of coins and the number of pounds are going to be different, right? And so one, one said, you know, like, say, 130, and that was the number of coins, and the other said 200 pounds, and that was the weight. Both are right, but they're saying it a different way. And so it looks like an error when, again, what's being conveyed to you? The idea that there was this much gold. It doesn't matter whether it was a denarii or it was a talent or what it was. It, the big deal is that it, there's this much gold, right? And one text will say it one way and one text will say it another. But in the end, does it matter? No, because it's still conveying the basic idea. And that's what we're really aiming at, right? So well, I uh, would have probably looked right over that, what you just said. Mm -hmm. But now that you've said that, I probably will be, when I'm reading... Go back and look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I'm reading, you know, especially numbers, I'll mm -hmm. read it very carefully because... Like it could say pounds for this, and I don't know, 
euro for this. I'm just <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. just using. Well, know, a modern like, translation might use the word euro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, but can you see there's, there's, there's a lot of obstacles when you're dealing with a, a, a body of, of, of writing that spans that many centuries, right? You're bound to run into things that are going to make you scratch your head and wonder, right? But what is amazing is that there are so few things that make you scratch your head and wonder. That's the true wonder. You know what I mean? And this is the way we are as humans. We're, we tend to be glass half empty kind of people, you know? <laughs> When in, tree, when in reality, the great majority of what we have is just absolutely, it beats all odds. There's nothing like it. Not, and if we were going to reject a document based on things like that, then we can accept no historical document at all if we reject the Bible. Because the Bible's got more going for it than against it than any book ever. So if we're going to reject the Bible, you have to reject all of history by the same standard. You have to. That means you, you can't trust anything at all, period. Nothing. Nothing at all. So, yes, Stephen. I think the same people that are going to complain about the color of the curtains mm -hmm. are going to be the same people that say this is exactly what early humans look like because we found a tooth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or even worse, because Time Life drew a picture. Well, yeah. But they, 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 they were excavating. They found a tooth. So now we know that this person's like six feet tall and you know, covered in hair and brown and mm -hmm. hunched over, like, from a tooth? Yeah. <laughs> then right. later we find out it's a pig tooth. So. Yeah, exactly. I have a question, though. Why do you think they don't mention um, God directly in the whole book? In the book of Esther? Yeah. I really don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe because it's written from a perspective of just being a historical account from the natural. Oh, I, I don't told know. Stephen, I said maybe it's because it's talking about Jews. So, I mean, the, I mean, the, the they say Jew almost in every chapter at least mm -hmm. ten times. I, I I mean I just I just it's something I just noticed picked up on. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I hope maybe it's just because, but yeah. I did notice that they don't talk about God at all. Yeah, I mean it, God is clearly implied by fasting and prayer and and you know and someone's well, going to be used if you aren't used that kind of thing, but not directly mentioned. It's, it's, mm -hmm. God is obviously in there somewhere. Oh yeah, it's in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, but it's it's a fabulous book, and uh, but I, I thought that was a good place to end. So there's a little, little bit of cliffhanger, and it allowed us to have some talking time, which is good. So, uh, but I will look into that green thing for you. I promise, because I'm interested myself. Myself. Is that going to be on the web page? I can put it there. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. All right, then let's go ahead and close and pray. Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.